All right, everyone, welcome back. Today we're talking about Renaissance fairs, Dungeons and Dragons, Satan worshippers, and that time I made an illegal purchase from an arms dealer. <laughs> So, Chris, I'm sorry again that I wasn't able to uh, hang out with you and uh, some of the guys that we know in high school. Uh, as uh, as you know, Chris, but maybe the people out there don't know, uh, a couple times a year, maybe even a few times a year, we get together with some buddies from high school that all congregate here in uh, San Diego. And we basically, I don't know, we have our own version of this show, right? It just happens to be around beers and uh, really bad bar food. But we basically, if you were to listen to us talking... Uh, you, me, and our three or four other buddies, it sounds like an episode of Nice Poll, right? When we all get together. Um, and I'm sorry, I, I wasn't able to make it out this time around because I had I uh, went to a wedding. It was really interesting, you know? It was a wedding where they actually encouraged the guests to uh, to do cosplay, right? To actually dress up in your favorite fantasy costume. Normally, you would think that that is a daunting ask, right? Like, I don't know that I have any fantasy clothing, right? But of course, there's me, Chris. And what am I thinking? You, you didn't know what to wear. You couldn't decide, right? Too many choices. Way too many choices, right? So uh, do, I, do I wear the Stormtrooper armor? No, it's going to be too hot for that. I can't wear the Stormtrooper armor. Do I wear the Spider-Man costume? Well, uh, got a little extra uh, luggage there in the belly. I'm trying to work on that. Uh, so maybe not that. Um, but it was shocking when I opened up the cedar chest in our uh, upstairs closet. How many, how many goddamn costumes were in there? Uh, too many. Too many, Chris, for a grown adult. That is, uh, that's a whole different episode. But you know what? It was actually really cool. Uh, everybody got into it. So you're absolutely right about uh about cosplay uh I, I think and again for anyone listening who, who's not sure about what we're speaking of maybe they don't know it the term but they definitely know it when they see it uh somebody dressing up in a costume right and and for more likely it's not for an event such as a convention such as even though i think even now people will do it to go to like a movie you know if, if the new if any Star Wars movie comes out or something like that, and right, and they'll and they'll wear their costumes, um, but there's a few things that strike me about it now uh, than 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 from a long time ago. Number one, how elaborate the costumes are, right? How how really impressive people make these costumes. Number two, uh, how how common it is and how popular it is is the fact that yeah, there's there's although I, I had to have some thoughts on that as well. Is you know how many people do it, um, and and. Number three, I think, is just, um, just it's kind of yeah, it's kind of accepted. It's kind of yeah. So we had, if we'd established several episodes back about trips to Comic Con and how it wasn't the coolest thing in the world, and now it's this massive, you know, annual event, and it's used all the you know it's been bastardized and it's been used for for marketing, you know, films and streaming series and merchandise and everything else. And the actual, it's, it's dead compared to the actual spirit of it when it started in the early seventies. But, the, you know, and but people very much it's it's like their their geek Christmas, right? It's like going to like something like that in their dress like Wolverine or dress like, you know, a Jedi Knight or Wonder Woman or whatever. And again, it's very elaborate and it's very like I said, it's 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 a subculture. Right. I think it's absolute subculture. Uh, the thing that's funny to me is because, yes. And again, we've established this. I, the, the multiple times that I went to uh, Comic-Con as just a discerning adult and just there to just kind of walk around and, and look at the old comic books and the other stuff that was the other stuff that was there. Um, you know, and people would always go, oh, do you dress up in a costume? And I'd go like, yeah, no, I don't. OK. And I always equated it to kind of like you ever watch a, like a football game on TV. Right. And let's say you've got a stadium with like 70,000 people in it. And what do they always show? Right. When they cut to the crowd, they show the guy with a, his face painted or something like that. Right. They show the guy with, the you know, like that Seinfeld episode. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. They show the guy dressed as Darth Raider. Right. He's like the Oakland Raider, but he's Darth Vader. 
And that's literally just a small percentage of the crowd, right? So I would explain that. You go to a football game and do you paint your face, you know, or do you dress up as a robot? No, but somebody is, and that's what they show on TV. And that was much like these events, like Comic-Con, that's what they show up on TV. Now, I'm not so sure. Now, I haven't been in a few years, so I think it's probably a little more prevalent. And to have a cosplay wedding pretty much sums up that it is, it's here, um, it's not going anywhere, you know, and I think that the fact, how many did you say, again, the, it was not, it was a backyard wedding. It was not large. It was not in some, right. It was not in, you know, some, uh, I don't know what, you know, some restaurant or, or church hall or something like that. Right. So it was fairly small. Yeah. It was outdoors in a park and it was, uh, actually in this really cool little area. That's kind of, uh, off to the side and hidden next to a little stream. It was really pretty. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah, then everybody dressed up there and then we all went back to the uh, person's uh, house and okay. uh, just hung out in the backyard. And uh, again, it was it was I would say that of the, uh, you know, 50 or so guests, um, over half of them were dressed up. Uh, it okay. was uh, pretty impressive, man. They were into it. So, yeah, with a, the with a bride and groom, obviously. And so they must have had some sort of theme together. Right. Like they weren't going to be like two. They weren't going to be like two completely different cult characters from popular culture, I would imagine. Yeah, no, they um they dressed as the thing that they wanted to dress as. And it wasn't uh, this was not uh, some of the people were dressed up as, like I said, uh, recognizable anime characters or things mm -hmm. like that. Um, they dressed up as just sort of fantasy cosplay. It wasn't specifically any one person. OK, it was just sort of what they wanted to dress up as kind of like uh, back in the day, Chris, and they have them still, uh, which is the Renaissance Fair. Right. right. Uh, you know, back in the 70s, um, you know, those were really popular. But I, I would say, if anything, they're getting more popular. They're uh, they're big business these days. The Renaissance Fair. Well, I think the, the level and again, whether it's cosplay or whether it's something like the Renaissance Fair. And I actually I knew someone um, he was actually like accountant and his brother. That was his business. He made he made Renaissance Fair costumes but they call them the garments, I guess, right? So they had an even, it wasn't like, no, he didn't make costumes. I think, and and to me, it's like the, the level of, what I think what's most impressive to that is the level of commitment, right? The fact that you have to, I mean, not only committed to wear it, but the, just the commitment, because again, again, these things look elaborate, they look expensive, they look, ex they're extremely detailed and made, you know, authentic, you know, based on what the actual, you know, uh, source material of their costume is and it kind of reminds me when you would remember these like some of these getting back to like you know you'd see a movie and you'd see spider-man like making his suit right and it's like wow he's got some great skills he's sitting in his with a sewing machine and he knows how to make a suit or some superhero like that so this is kind of i guess people know they do do it for there is a is a big business out there that was always the biggest letdown for me because i would read comic books just like you chris and when I saw my favorite superhero creating their costume in one of the <laughs> Origins episodes, right? And to your right. point, it just looks so easy. I wanted to be Spider-Man so bad as a kid, but they didn't have right. good Spider-Man costumes. As you guys know, back in the 70s, the Halloween costumes were the shittiest things you could ever put on, right? Not only was it just a thing that you put on, uh, what was it, like a jumpsuit, right, Chris? It was just a almost like a one-piece overalls that right. you would put on. And if it was Herman Munster, for instance, it didn't look like Herman Munster. On the front of it, it would actually say the Munsters, right? So that was always a big disappointment right then and there back in the day. Plus, you'd get those half masks that were made out of that really shitty. Do we already talk about this? I feel like we might have. I don't we know. Did. But yeah. those really crappy little plastic half masks with the tiny little slit that you would, you know, uh, Barely cut your tongue out. on the very first time that you tried to breathe, right? You'd slice your tongue open. And there would be blood everywhere. But my point is, costumes were really bad uh, back when you and I were kids trying to cosplay something. Nowadays, to your point, the costumes for these cosplay things, you see people in their garage with like uh, a 3D printer and a foam cutter and, and a glue gun and an airbrush. And they're making giant life-size transformer robot cosplay, right? They're, they, look ex they look so good in their, in their uh, Iron Man armor that it looks 
almost better than the Marvel movie itself, right? And these are just people in their in their mom's basement, so to speak. Um, I'm one of them. I'm not trying to disparage them, but I mean, we are what we are. Uh, and even at the day back in the day, Chris, when I had Stormtrooper armor, this was you know, 15, 16 years ago, I would go to the comic book convention. And back then I was a God. If I had stormtrooper armor, that was like, Oh my God, look at this. This guy's got stormtrooper armor. Nowadays, that is so nothing that you just walk right by that guy. Right. You, unless you have a working blaster and an entire entourage with Darth Vader and the front end of a tie fighter all mocked up and ready to go. You ain't shit, buddy. The theme music playing as you're walking along, yeah. right? Somebody's got on. Absolutely. And that's, you're, like I said, the, the level of commitment. Are these people like, are, well, did you do this? Were you like pouring like plastic into a mold? You know what I mean? Were you like having to go? No. Like, were you, it's like, so I can't even, I, I'm not the hand. I, I can't imagine doing that because I, I'm challenged to hang a picture correctly. Right. Because it's like, to me, I'm not the most mechanical person. There are many people will vouch for that. You know, so to me, the fact that I'm just going to make uh, this, I'm going to make an Ant-Man suit complete with a right. helmet and it's going to, people are going to be impressed and they're going to want to take their picture with me. Um, it's amazing to me. Like I said, it's so I don't, you know, so yeah, not only were those superheroes super skilled, they had powers, but their powers also, also included like, hey, they could tailor their own clothes. Right. Well, so. yeah. But I mean, Chris, let me explain to you just really quickly to your excellent point. You know, did I pour the mold to create this stormtrooper armor? And the answer is no. But when I was a kid and Star Wars first came out and you and I were both probably equally excited about Star Wars back in 1977, I tried to make stormtrooper armor by just cutting up pieces of foam. Guess how far I got? Not far, Chris. Not far at all. It was really bad. When I bought the stormtrooper armor, the guy that sold it to me made me feel like he was a fucking arms dealer. OK, <laughs> he had the stormtrooper armor in the trunk of his car. He made me meet him in the parking lot of some whatever it was, Target. And he opened it up like I was literally buying AR-15s or some kind of a flamethrower. And the reason he was so nervous is because apparently that was a time when Lucasfilm was really coming after people. That we're mm -hmm. trying to make money on anything that was licensed by Star Wars. So he's like, hey, man, you cannot tell anybody where you got this from. And it was just so funny to me. I couldn't stop laughing as this guy is just going, no, man, you don't understand. I could get in a lot of trouble. All right. And we I did a cash deal with him and then quietly put it into my car and drove off into the night. Right. <laughs> with with stormtrooper armor. You would have thought that I was heading off to the oil fields right to, to in kuwait or something so uh i don't know very funny a lot much ado about nothing when he opened the trunk did, was there like a big glowing light like the suitcase like in pulp fiction you know what i mean and they the light because cause it was just like that's a great because yes he probably thought yeah because you could have been right i'm sure there's a division of the you know copyright law enforced by whatever law enforcement law enforcement agency right and he thought you were undercover and the second he handed you that helmet um, that all of a sudden two or three cars were going to come from out of nowhere and a bunch of guys, windbreakers yep. were going to jump up and point, you know, point their guns at them. That's, that is hilarious. They're nerf blasters. Yeah. So you had no paper trail, right? It's like, forget no. you ever met me. No, no, like, no paper trail. He didn't tell you his real name. Yeah. Right. He says, you, you, you know, you no. can call, you can call me, I don't know, uncle Owen or something like that. Right. And essentially <laughs> that was, that was how you did all of your, uh, that was how you did all of your, that's, that's amazing. Oh, and by the way, let's talk about Uncle Owen for a second. The actor that played Luke's uncle, Uncle Owen, his character was a curmudgeon -y, grumpy old man that didn't want to lose child labor, right? He didn't want Luke to avenge his, his dad or anything like that. He just wanted some extra help around the farm. Not in harvest season. Exactly. So I went to Comic-Con one year and there he is. Mm -hmm. There's that actor that played Uncle Owen. Right. He volunteered to go there. He volunteered to sit in front of a, a card table and sign pictures of himself. And I'm telling you, man, I don't know if he was purposely in character or that was just the grumpiest human on the planet. He acted like Uncle Owen. It was just like, what do you want this for? What's your name? Make, I'm only going to do this once. So make sure I get the spelling right because I ain't doing it again. I'm like, wow, you, you really are Uncle Owen. Come on, man. You know, I, I just want to I just want to meet with, uh, you know, Wedge and uh, go go uh, bullseye womp rats. 
Yeah, don't be goofing off. Don't be go- fooling around with all your friends. Did you buy the photo from Uncle Owen? I did, but I mean, my God, you would think that I was insulting him by even walking up to him. It was just, he was so grumpy. How yeah. much did you pay for that photo? Oh, I don't know. I, I bet it was like uh, $15 or something. Wow, I'm surprised um, it was even that much. Yeah. Okay. I, I mean, I've, I've collected some great 8x10s in my days at Comic-Con. One mm-hmm. of my most cherished ones is Avon Craig, who played Batgirl. Right. Uh, and then my other favorite one, of course, is Julie Newmar, who was Catwoman. Oh, man, that is at the top of my collection. But my greatest of all autographed photo is dun, 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 Adam West. And this is what he said on the photo, Chris. Are you ready? Remember, Jeff, evil never sleeps that's what he wrote oh my god was it great i just i love that photo i i worship it to this day it's in a place of honor um right above my favorite your bed. shows of all time right yeah no yeah. i didn't no i i didn't all i got was i didn't get i didn't get any sort of uh mantra or anything on my adam west so um that is that's amazing yeah. that is amazing so you were committed you you you, you were committed or should have been to go meet some guy right Right. You're, you're committed to go meet some guy at a Best Buy parking lot. Right. And yeah, right. do this all cash deal with, you know, small, yeah. small unmarked bills. Right. Yep. And then you had to wait. Like right? he, he was like, he probably left. He said, you got to wait for 10 minutes before you can leave. Right. He probably took off. Or, I mean, he, he wanted to make sure he wasn't followed. Right. Um, that is yep. an amazing. But again, that is a that's a level of commitment. Did you put you didn't you waited till you got home before you put the costume on or did you drive home with it? now? Well, here's the thing. Um, and by the way, we didn't even talk about the fact that he made me jump into a swimming pool just so that he would know that I wasn't wired, Chris. He just wanted to make sure I wasn't wearing a wire. He I'm not sure if I added did. that part he in. He didn't make you do that. No, he didn't. But that would be awesome. <laughs> uh, so this was a sort of do-it-yourself uh, prop armor, mm-hmm. right? So I had to actually assemble a lot of the okay. pieces myself. Uh, but they were all perfect. I mean, it's like, yeah, I mean, when I was done and I put that thing on, Holy shit, it is a stormtrooper. And I wore it back in the day when I worked in Hollywood at these post-production studios working on TV shows and stuff. I wore that on Halloween and I was coming around the corner in one of the corridors behind the editing bays. And the woman who was the head of operations didn't expect it at all. She came around the corner, saw a stormtrooper with full armor and a blaster walking towards her. Chris, it startled her so bad. She started backpedaling and literally fell on her ass and knocked the wind out of her. And I felt so bad. But I mean, that was the effect that the costume had on her. It was just like, holy shit, that is insane. Now, again, nowadays, we're so immune to it that who cares, right? Uh, well, well, it, was, it yeah. wasn't Carrie Fisher, was it? It wasn't why that wasn't the, the one. No. That's why she was she was afraid. But I mean, again, no. I, I, you talk about that. Like I said, the lev- like the Renaissance fairs were a little bit to me, a little bit and more unusual because really, because I, I don't think of, well, it, to me, it's, it, the Renaissance was always just studying about a time in history that I didn't really give a you know, tiny rat's ass about. So, I mean, so to me, it's a little broader, right? It's like, you don't, you're not necessarily playing a character. You're just sort of, or are you, what do they do? I never, I never knew what they did it besides drinking, well, besides drinking ale, right. Or something like that. What did they do at a Renaissance fair? Yeah, let me give you some insight. So back in the 70s, my brother, who's older than me, um, I came along a little bit later, Chris. Some might say that I was a mistake. Others would just say a pleasant surprise. But my two older brothers are 13 and 16 years older than me. So my older brother, Greg, uh, he, to this day, still belongs to a group called the SCA, the Society for Creative Anachronism, which is a very fancy way of saying, right, a, a medieval group. Right. And now they have this amazing uh, world that they've created where they meet up. It's nationwide. They dress up in actual armor. They actually fight each other with swords. Now, these are made out of wood, rattan, um, but they have full on battles and they beat the shit out of each other. And if you get hit in the arm, your arm is gone and all that. But these guys have full on military tactics their armies can consist of 50 to 100 people. They actually use maneuvers that real, you know, military generals and captains have used over time. And they, at nighttime, party hard and, and drink ale and, and the mead and all the food you can imagine. And uh, everyone has a great time. 
Um, then, of course, right, the next day, it's back to battle again. And these guys actually battle each other from city to city, from state to state. So I kind of grew up in that and had a really fun time doing that with my brother. But an extension of that would have been the Renaissance Fair. And the Renaissance Fair would be more for anybody at the Del Mar racetrack, for instance, right, to come by for the day and pretend that you're in medieval times. So you're going to get a whole range of people, right? You're going to get some people that are just tourists just walking around. You're going to get some people that half ass it. You know, I have a little tunic on, but I also have my, my back in the day, my pager, right? <laughs> so I'm not really very authentic. Then you're going to have the people that are in full, to your point, garments, right? Just Hollywood quality prop costumes. And what do they do? They do jousting tournaments. Uh, they play drinking games. Uh, obviously, you can eat the big turkey leg. Um, there's all kinds of ways to win prizes. You can buy super expensive handmade jewelry, right? That kind of thing. So I don't know, man. If you're, if you're, uh, you know, kind of nerdy and have a good imagination, it's pretty fun. Or you could just go to medi medieval times, right, in Buena Park, where you can watch jousting. You can eat with your hands. You can drink out of like a yeah a big stein. Um, but that's no see that that clears it up a little bit. Because, again, I only knew them by reputation. I didn't know what they really did. Um, so, again, I think a certain level of commitment, a certain level of um, interest that's a little bit, you know, a, a subculture on its own. A lot like, you know, now which came first? Did medieval, like, did the Renaissance fairs come first? Or did, like, Dungeons and Dragons come first? Where they, where it's, or where it's all sort of organically came together, right? Is and Dungeons and Dragons did that come out of Lord of the Rings, right? I mean, where did? Because I remember, I remember the Renaissance fairs hearing about them, and then I remember again Dungeons and Dragons. Again, I have an older brother as well who decided who that um, played Dungeons and Dragons with his super cool friends all night long. Um, you know, they'd start at like ten o'clock at night after they got off their you know their part time jobs during the summer or whatnot and would play, you know, with, I don't know if there was a board and there was dice and you had characters and right. Did that come out of the Renaissance? Where did that come from? Yeah. Lord of the Rings probably came first in terms of a book, you know, that sure. was written uh, Renaissance fairs, I believe have been around for a really, really, really long time. Um, so I guess I would say Renaissance fairs certainly uh, happened before Lord of the Rings, I would imagine came out, but, um, D and D that, as I recall, and we can check this, I guess, but without looking at my little Google machine, I'm thinking it was the, uh, late seventies, early eighties or something like that, that D and D started becoming popular. And I will say, Chris, that, uh, to this day, I still play role-playing games like that with my brother, the same guy that, uh, introduced me to the society for creative anachronism and they're fun. It's, uh, you know, you, you, you get drunk and you pretend to be someone else and you have these adventures and it's actually pretty cool. But um, I remember, Chris, do you remember in the 70s and 80s, like uh, we were convinced or at least, you know, some some advocacy group was convinced that any kid that played D&D &D was a devil worshiper. Remember that? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, I like how you said when I asked you if you played D&D &D, or I asked you if you played Dungeons and Dragons and you started talking about D&D, &D, it's like, okay. Tell me you played Dungeons and Dragons without telling me you played Dungeons and Dragons as you referred to it as as D D. <laughs> Good point. Um, so <laughs> I think right. that yeah. part, and I love how you talked about getting you know getting drunk and pretending you're somewhere else. Otherwise, it's like we I did that, but that was usually in a place you know uh, I was in Vegas or someone getting drunk and pretending I was yeah else. exactly the satanic part. The, Satan Satan really got a bad rap, okay? Because I think Satan was an easy mark. Satan was a bad. You're right. Anything like that, that had magic and wizards, right? Or I don't know, spells or, you know, something, right? Sorcerers. That's all, yeah, they, they, all, right. all those painted to, all those lines pointed to the devil, right? Just like, you know, heavy metal music pointed toward, the, pointed to the devil. Just like anything that was, it didn't have to be, anti it didn't necessarily have to be the antichrist although we had plenty of that in popular culture which was always like really yeah, popular yeah. which i thought okay there, there's something there right they're not saying people are pulling for the antichrist but i think people you know are, 
are interested in that sort of thing. <laughs> but, you know, but... You don't think people are polling for the Antichrist? Oh, I think people are in general. I, I don't know if it's the... I don't think it's... You know, I don't think the majority of people, I don't know. I could be wrong. I'd like to think they weren't. I mean, that's a right. little weird. Yeah. But like being against the devil was for a time, it's like, it's like being against cancer, right? Well, of course I know the devil, you know, and then now I think it's hilarious because people will make devil references. There's a, there is a documentary, documentary out somewhere that's about Satanism and the church of Satan and, and whatever, just because, and just really about the history and people that are still part of it. And, and it's great because they, they are protected by the constitution, which they should be right. As being like any right. other you yeah. know, organized religion. Um, but I think, you know, the devil to me was always, I said, is an easy mark. That's an easy bad guy. But at the same time, it's just, you know, it, it was just, like I said, people would get up, whether it was music, it, it just crossed all, you know, music or yes, board games or films or, you know, individuals, right? Whether it's, you know, Ozzy Osbourne comes to mind or something like that. He was, yeah. the, he, you know. The, yeah, the devil's an easy target. Yeah, the uh, Antichrist. Yeah. You know, and all of that sort of stuff. So I, it's hilarious that, you know, I think people still sort of do that. Although again, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, I like, I, I see the humor in it and I think it's great. You know, there's a Twitter account that's, you know, there's one that's from God allegedly, and there's another one from, you know, Satan and they're hilarious, you know, which, you know, you couldn't get around with joking, get, get along with joking about something like that. 30, 40. Years no, you ago. can't, you can't joke about certain religions, according to some people. And, you know, not to get too deep into that, but. Well, I also, like I said, that the devil is the fall guy, right. And somebody could even blame, you know, that if they want to make, especially if they were somewhat religious or if they um, did something that was maybe against their, you know, their values and they could, they could, you could blame the devil, right? Even Flip Wilson said, the devil made me do it, right? That was on one of those variety shows in the 70s. Exactly. Right. But then wow, again, Flip Wilson, that's a great poll. Wow. You know, the, Congratulations the, on that. Well, yeah. Thank you. The, the films, again, whether it was Rosemary's Baby or The Exorcist or The Omen. Yeah. Or any of these films where it was something satanic. It always does crack me up that, uh, you know, these kids playing D&D &D back in the late 70s and 80s were accused of being Satanists. And when you actually look at these kids, these are kids that are just afraid to ask a girl out. He's literally wearing a tinfoil uh, wizard's hat. You know, and has a little a little sword in his hand and 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 embroidered stars on his cape. And he's just trying to, for just one quick second, live in a world where he's empowered and he's not being bullied. And this is the kid that we're supposed to believe is the all powerful Satanist summoning Beelzebub from the bowels of hell, right? That's that's the guy we're worried about, that kid. Yeah, yes. sorry. If you want to worry about someone, Chris. Worry about the furries. Let's talk about them for a second. I don't even know how to begin with the furries. I think it was probably 20, I, I, I mean, again, I, again, that was another subculture that I wasn't really aware of. And then probably 20 or 25 years ago, I saw something, It was and it was on MTV of all places, right? And it was a documentary about furries and plushies and things like that. And they were, and they had little, you know, they had like little mixers, right? <laughs> people wearing these costumes yeah. and, and you think about it, it's kind of brilliant because at the time like they were wearing these costumes and you had no idea who what the person looked like on the you know on the inside um it, it, and you just kind of went <laughs> but that i don't know i i, I and i don't, i'm guessing we don't have any furry listeners or as that that's i find disturbing that i i think you can find Again, you, you just nailed the the D and D kid who is just escaping into. Hey, guess what? I'm going to be a hero, right? I'm going to fight. I'm going to fight a demon, or I'm going to fight a dragon, or I'm going to do whatever. Or the same thing, like the person who becomes a superhero, or the person who becomes Captain Kirk, right? I get all of that, or even gets yeah. to be like, I'm going to be the scary. Per I'm going, but I'm going to, I'm I'm going to. In that case, it's like I'm going to be this character that's powerful and memorable and and leaves a lasting impression i don't understand how it becoming a you know maybe a five foot ten inch stuffed animal does that same thing right i don't understand the core that i don't get if you can explain it to me 
go for it. Yeah, I'm not I'm not freaked out over those kids that play D&D. I'm freaked out over people, yeah, to your point, that that dress up as mascots, right? That dress up as koala bears and chipmunks and uh get in these giant costumes and uh do all kinds of stuff. Now, more power to you. Do whatever you want, man. If no one's getting hurt, that's great, but yeah. You know, somewhere between uh, the movie Don't Be Afraid of the Dark, as I mentioned, where there's little tiny demons and uh, and people dressing up in giant furry costumes and doing creepy things. uh, That's where my head kind of snaps. That's where my brain can't take it anymore. And it reminds me of the movie The Shining, where you look down that hallway Mm -hmm. and you see those two men, you know, sitting in that room. And one of them has like a pig's mask on. He kind of looks at the camera it's that same moment where you're like, this is not right. That's not how it's supposed to be. Mm-hmm. That's not, that's what? Oh my gosh. I, I don't know why. You know, again, furries, exactly. you know, I guess exactly. it's pretty harmless, but man, they creep me out. Show me how you're going to escape into yeah, your, your humdrum life. You're going to become something else in another place with other people or not people who are dressed as something else. And you're going to be my little pody. Right. I, I just I, I show me where that makes sense. As I right. said, when you're, you're not heroic, when you're not unique, when you're not a super idealized, flawless, um, super powered person or thing or whatever. But you're a pony. And um, and all you are a pony. Ent- exactly. All that, that entails. You're a pony. Right. I feel like, Chris, I must be missing something. Right. We, we've seen that. I think you and I both agreed or we both talked about this, right, that we saw that documentary or at least you're aware of it. Right. Where they talk about the the My Pretty Pony fans. But these people take it to the next level. Right. Where they really are in love with the world of My Pretty Pony. And keep in mind, guys, these aren't uh, six to eight year old girls from the 90s. These are grown adults, men and women. Who who see the world of My Pretty Pony, which I think came out in the '90s, right? I'm pretty sure that's when yeah, My Pretty Pony My, came My out. My Little Pony. Uh-huh. They they see that as their version of utopia. They see that as a utopian society where everyone lives in peace and harmony. And I guess that's a really innocent thought. That's really nice. But again, there's also an element to it where you're like, wait, what now? <laughs> Just wait, what? And I, I've tried really hard to like go. Maybe I should watch an episode and not judge it, you know. But when I watch half of an episode, I'm like, nope, it's just what I thought it was. It's a bunch of ponies. You know, it's someone trying to sell merchandise. I guess I just don't get it. But for these people, it's their Star Trek, right? I told you that I love Star Trek because it creates this beautiful vision of the future where somehow humanity survived. We made it, right? And now we're reaching out to the stars. These people, that's your utopia, right? Rainbows and ponies, I I guess. I mean, it, it could be worse. Pink, pink clouds, right, and fluffy tails, and you're right. It, it's, it's. I, I cannot make the connection. I cannot see where that would be your ideal. Think of a world where you can be, where you could be anything, and I'm going to be a pony, right? I'm not a superhero. I'm not a space traveler. I'm not. Uh, again, I'm not a knight in in the literal shining armor. Uh, I'm, I'm a pony. I, I'm a pony star. And, and, you know, and I think Star Trek may have been the one, if we go all, we kick, wind it all the way back to like cosplay. I think Star Trek, cause again, I can think going back many, many years when people dressed up and dressed up for something like comic con, the Star Trek one was the easy one, right? Cause it was like, if you could somehow replicate that shirt that they wore, the gold or the blue or the red shirt, mm-hmm. pair of black pants. Sure you were good to go, right? Maybe yeah, you got pretty really, simple. really, you got really creative and you went for Mr. Spock and you, you put on the pointy ears. So mm-hmm. I think you could probably make the case historically that that sort of started that aspect of the cause, you know, and then so I could, it's, it's being a plushie is that cosplay. I say no. Okay. Because I just think. It's Did you a say little, a plushie? Yes, is that what it's called? A, a, a plushie, a furry, whatever. Yeah. It might be furry. Okay, oh, but I, but I but I was I was I was scared for a minute there, Chris. Okay. I thought you had you're you're about to reveal a new subgenre right. where you you would uh you'd be a plushie Maybe, like right. that was a whole new group of people a right. plushie. I okay. Yes, or I just but you have... could be a but but Chris, what is the guy version? Isn't it a brony? 
The Brony is the pony, I think. Yeah, absolutely. The Brony is the My Pretty Pony my or that's, worshiper who happens to be a guy, right? That's oh, a Brony. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Right. Right. So yeah. I, the okay. Full, yeah. So so yes, the the okay, the, the furry. Like I said, I don't see it. I don't see the storyline there. I don't see the hero. You know the the you know heroism. I don't see the adventure. I don't see the Star Trek sort of element. And then and then maybe like I said, but I think Star Trek is really what sort of kicked that off. And then maybe the subsequent, um, the uh, I want to say all the various versions, various iterations of Star Trek that came on after, right? Because there was a what 30 year gap 20 year gap between the original star trek series and then when the you know the next generation came on um and that was and that was more elaborate the special effects actually did look cheesy and the costumes were a little more space suity right and i think people did that um <clears throat> in star trek and all its various spin-offs right so I think i'd like that, to uh dub that as an official term space suity Space I like suit. that space okay. suity. I like right. that, man. Right. Yeah, we've definitely dubbed some unique uh, phrases and mm -hmm. uh, terms. Uh, I'm I'm usually the king of words that so. don't really exist that I've made right. up, but that right. was a good one. We're space suity. A, we're gonna need our own glossary, I think, or our own wiki. Yeah, but I mean, I think in Star Trek and all of those Star Trekian shows, um, all did that. The costumes, and so then people started again. They got a little bit better. There was no Party City when we were kids, though, right? Because even though Party City has, and obviously there was no internet. I think if you really want to say, I'm going to, if I have, if I want to find a costume and I'm going to go on the internet and I want to be a cosplayer and you don't even have to do the work, right? You don't have to have a 3D printing, you know, a 3D printer or any kind of sewing skills or be able to make molds. You just have to have a credit card, right? And then you can get the most elaborate costume of course. that you want. And right? go to Amazon, the shittiest costume that you can get for that thing that you want to be for Halloween mm -hmm. is mind-blowingly better than anything you could right. have ever hoped to achieve in the 70s and 80s. I'm talking about, you know, paying $30 for an Iron Man costume. That thing is really good. That $30 version that some kid is running around the streets with, mm -hmm. that thing is, that thing's amazing compared to what we had when we were kids. If there's, there are no, um, rubber, there are no yeah. rubber bands. It doesn't say Iron Man. No. It doesn't say Iron Man across the front. No, no rubber bands, no Iron Man across the front. Always pissed me off. It will not burst into flame if it's next to a candle or anything like that. So definitely. Yeah, I think we've different. mentioned that. Those those costumes, not only were they not flame retardant, they were flame attractive. If you if you lit a match to those things, they would go up quicker than something that goes up quick. I don't know. Give me an analogy, right? That thing was just instant. It was like flash paper. Uh, my God. And it would just melt to your skin just to make it worse. It's just the, the insanity. All those stories about, you know, razor blades in, in Halloween candy or broken glass. <clears throat> None of them were ever proven, but I guarantee some kid burst into flames getting too close yeah. to a jack-o'-lantern while dressed as Spider-Man. I'm sure that happened somewhere. Right. If you're wondering why we weren't scared of razor blades and apples, it's because the thing that we were wearing was infinitely more dangerous than any of that, <laughs> you know? It's like, whatever, I'll take your razor blade. I'm just taking a chance wearing this goddamn costume right now. Right. Not only am I about to go hypothermic in it, but uh, this thing, like I said, if you get near a candle, that could be it for you, pal. Ask any ER doctor. Have they ever treated anybody for Halloween candy? They'd say no, but did anybody ever come in based on some sort of costume injury? And they've probably got stories, right? I think to this so day, there are people whose chest and arms still have remnants right of the of the uh halloween costume basically uh permanently etched into their skin right yeah well looking back so cosplay uh renaissance fairs and dungeons and dragons or D D, as some people call it um satanism i think there's a lot i think maybe we might have to do a, a, another episode getting a little deeper into satanism um I want to say, I won't say plushies, furries, um, all that. Uh, I, I, I think this, this is a very, this is a very special episode of nice poll because we, <laughs> we dove into, we, we dove into some, some subcultures, I think. Right. That's, yeah. Very, very strange that we got on that topic. Don't know why. Don't know how, but, uh, yeah. So nice, nice, nice job. Nice episode. Um, I think I'm gonna go have some Chinese food. So 
You don't even you don't even have to ask. Oh, I was going to ask you, what's it going to be tonight? OK, so tonight it's going to be some Chinese food. Now, is it going to be fresh Chinese food or do you have stuff in the refrigerator that you're going to pull out there? No, I don't know. I think it might it, it will not be served in styrofoam and somebody might actually take our order. Ooh, wow. All right. So till next time, Jeff. All right. Till next time, Chris. Thank you.